How's it going everyone, Brainchild here, and today we're going to be looking at the rendering technology behind Animal Crossing New Horizons. Now I know what some of you are probably thinking, a tech analysis for an Animal Crossing game? Doesn't this guy have anything better to do besides complain about the lack of fur shading of Hominuk or the missing pores on the skin of the villagers? Well as it turns out, we're doing a tech analysis on this game because its graphical improvements are so substantial that it would be a disservice to the artists and programmers who put these visuals together if we didn't talk about what a great job they've done with realizing this art style. Don't be fooled by the folksy charm, the Animal Crossing engine has set its sights on New Horizons, and I couldn't be happier to talk about it. So let's get into it. So right off the bat we're looking at a significant improvement in the way that footprints are handled in Animal Crossing. Notice how each print is shaded in the same direction as the shadows that are cast over the environment. This technique is known as normal mapped decals. You can think of decals as stickers that you slap on top of a pre-existing surface. The main difference between this technique and the decals used in the previous Animal Crossing games is that the shading of the footprints can change in real time based on the direction that the light source is facing. Now you might be wondering why the developers would even bother with such a minute technical change in the first place. After all, the footprints in the previous games still look like footprints. However, unlike the previous Animal Crossing games, from the time of day changes in New Horizons, the direction in which the shadows are cast also change. So in the presence of dynamic shadows in the environment, a footprint decal will look noticeably out of place if its shading wasn't consistent with its surroundings. So considering that this is just trailer footage that we're reviewing and I haven't had an extended time-lapse view of this game, I can't really say for sure, but the game appears to have some kind of emulation of Rayleigh scattering. The gradients of color that are reflected on the water and the ground, starting from the horizon to farther down near the player's position, appear to have a somewhat realistic falloff and change in hue. This is a natural phenomenon that happens during sunsets in real life and appears to be emulated pretty well here. Now, it'll take a little bit more investigation to determine how exactly the sky is being rendered here, but seeing as how time of day has always been a pretty important component of Animal Crossing gameplay, I'm inclined to say that the game utilizes hemisphere lighting that has been tuned to parameters consistent with Rayleigh scattering. This halo that you see around the sun is an artistic take on me scattering, presumably through the use of a me scattered coefficient and a bloom shader. It looks absolutely incredible. Also we can see directional lighting on the clouds, depending on the sun's position, which is a nice touch. So I really like how the background environment is handled here. The farther the objects are in the distance, the more visible the atmospheric scattering and depth of field blur become. This has the effect of making the game world as a whole feel larger than it actually is, which is really useful in a game like Animal Crossing, where the play area can be quite small. Big improvement here. So this little ring of light you see reflected on the villagers hair here is something known as an anisotropic highlight. And honestly, it's by far the most surprising rendering feature I've seen for this game so far. For those of you unfamiliar with the term, anisotropic lighting has to do with the fact that certain surfaces, like brushed metal or human hair, don't reflect light specularly in the same direction, even from the same light source. Instead, the light is reflected in different directions, typically perpendicular to the direction that the grooves or strands that make up the fabric of the surface travel in. For more realistic simulations and real-time rendering, this can be incredibly computationally expensive to calculate, and is usually avoided when using specular lighting in video games. So suffice to say that if I were to come up with a list of the type of games that would call for an isotropic lighting, an Animal Crossing game would literally be dead last on that list, if it made the list at all. Now I think it's safe to say that this game doesn't use some of the more complex models for calculating an isotropic lighting, so I'm going to assume it's using a much more efficient method so as not to negatively impact performance. One of the cheaper ways to render such an effect is to utilize the UV coordinates in a tangent space normal map to get more granular information about the orientation of the surface of the texture instead of the more broad data about the geometry that the surface is attached to. In other words, if the engine knows how one part of this hair texture is oriented relative to another part of this same hair texture, it can calculate the directions in which the specular highlights should be reflected along the hair surface. Something to keep in mind is that strands of hair in this game are represented in the form of a texture, so it's a lot easier to calculate lighting for surfaces that are much more simplified. Still, the effect looks fantastic and even has varying levels of intensity based on how exposed it is to light. So color me impressed. The follow through animation here is also a nice touch. Now you can tell all of your friends who are sitting on the fence about buying a new Animal Crossing game that they should totally get New Horizons just for the Bane physics. Okay, maybe not, but it's still cool. 
So this time-lapse sequence has so much visual information packed into it that we're going to have to break this down in several takes. First, take note of all of the objects casting directional shadows in the environment. The trees, the plants, the bugs, the crafted objects, no matter how big or small, they all cast shadows in the direction the incident light travels from the light source, in this case that source being the sun or the moon. Based on how the shadows change direction, we can deduce that the direction of light has an orbital path, which has an effect on the length of the shadows being cast depending on where the light source is positioned in the sky. Next, take a look at how the environment light changes as the day goes by. It starts off sunny, where every surface in the environment reflects its natural color. Grass is green, water is blue, etc. Then as time progresses, we start to see the slightest hint of an orangish hue. Then the cloud cover occludes the skylight as it starts to rain, so everything takes on a grayish hue, but it's still daylight, so shadows are very faint, and the light from the tent isn't reflected on the ground yet, due to all of the ambient lighting available under such weak sunlight conditions. We can also see some increased specularity on the leaves as a result of the rain. After the rain passes, we head into sunset lighting, where the environment takes on a pinkish, purplish glow, and the shadows start to get darker. Then we move into nighttime, as a clear, deep blue sky bathes the environment in its navy hue. Now we can see that the light emanating from the tent is reflected on the ground. What's more is that the tarpaulin material that the tent is made out of has its emissive channel boosted, and the material is also translucent in order to mimic the effect of subsurface scattering. I'd say it's pretty convincing. So looking at this sequence again, I'd like to touch on the visually interactive elements on display. Now something you've probably noticed when watching the reveal trailer for the first time is just how responsive the trees are to the wind blowing. Could there be some kind of wind simulation going on a la Breath of the Wild? Well, not quite. The animation here isn't so much physics based as it is artist driven. How I can usually tell the difference between the two is how deliberate and repetitive the animations are. And the animations here are exactly that. Truly physics based animations do not produce consistently looping animations like this. That isn't to say that there isn't an actual physics component to the engine, but it's pretty clear that artistic presentation is given precedence over physical realism. Having said that, the objects still look like they're being blown by the wind, and the developers have already stated that the speed in which the trees move will depend on the speed in which the wind blows. So there's definitely a dynamic wind system in place that influences the animation. It's just not entirely realistic, and that's okay. Something that does tip more over into the realistic side is the ripple effects that occur when something physically interacts with the water, or so it appears that way. Again, this isn't really a physically based approach as far as I can tell. What appears to be happening is that additional animated normal maps are blended with the pre-existing normal maps that make up the water during certain triggered events, like pulling an object out of the water, or individual raindrops coming into contact with the water, or vaulting over the water with a pole. But even without any complex tessellation or vertex displacement in the water during these events, I can appreciate that at least some level of interactivity is visually represented in some way instead of just having the water be non-interactive at all. Plus, it just looks really convincing. Even the water in the bucket gets the ripple treatment. The steam coming out of the barrel is also a nice touch. And as we comb over this sequence one last time, I want to point out something that we touched on a bit earlier, and that's the anisotropic highlights on the villagers' hair. Now at this point it might seem like I'm obsessing over this detail, and I guess I kind of am in a technical sense, but that's not without good reason. So if you look at the highlights as the time of day passes, you'll notice that the color of the highlights also change, in alignment with the ambient color from the environment lighting. But that's not really the interesting bit here. Upon closer inspection, we can see that there are multiple hues of anisotropic highlights on the villager hair, similar to how anisotropic highlights function on human hair in real life. The main reason this phenomenon occurs in real life is due to the microstructure of human hair follicles, in which the overlapping cuticles refract some of the incoming light internally before reflecting it back out, resulting in the highlights shifting color along the way. Phenomenologically, these highlights are usually categorized as secondary highlights, though the underlying physics is a lot more complex than these highlights being merely secondary. In New Horizons, the engine isn't really accounting for that level of physical complexity, which is why the secondary highlights like the greater longitudinal shift that we can see in the real life example. But it does mimic most of the notable intricacies of an isotropic light on human hair very well. We can even see that the secondary highlights shift toward the root of the hair, while the primary highlights shift toward the tip of the hair. This kind of attention to detail is really unprecedented for an Animal Crossing game, and I'm absolutely baffled as to why the developers went through so much effort to approximate this phenomenon so thoroughly, given the art style of this game. But then maybe that's exactly why they did it. 
You see, the geometry in Animal Crossing tends to stick to very rudimentary and simplistic shapes, leaving the texturing and lighting to provide more visual detail to the objects we see in the game. Obviously, the villagers can't be modeled with individual strands of hair, so maybe using an isotropic highlights was the developer's way to communicate to the players that the villagers do indeed have hair strands and aren't just wearing plastic hats of hair on their heads. Whatever the case may be, I consider an isotropic highlights to be a very, very welcome addition to the suite of rendering features on offer in the newest Animal Crossing game. What I love about this here is that every single clump and particle of dirt is casting a shadow. Granted, it's a lot easier for developers to handle shadows in this way as long as it doesn't impact performance, because all you have to do is turn directional shadow casting on and don't really have to worry about which models will cast shadows and which models won't. I'd imagine this is possible in New Horizons because, compared to open world games, the world isn't very large and the geometry isn't very complex, so giving everything a shadow isn't going to be too costly, relatively speaking. The general environment lighting for this scene looks great. Lots of ambient light since there's so much snow and cloud cover, and the faintest hint of me scattering to give the scene a wintry atmosphere. The actual snowflakes, however, aren't really all that aesthetically pleasing to me, but I think it's pretty cool that they actually land on the ground and then melt over time. I'm definitely going to be one of those people who stand outside in the winter watching the snowflakes melt for a good 10 minutes before doing anything productive. God, this game can't come soon enough. The subtlety of the depth of field here is really nice. If you look at the guitar, amp, and armoire, there's just a hint of blur, but only just enough to direct your attention to the character talking, and not so much that you can appreciate your surroundings during these moments. Very well done. Now try as I might, I'm not really detecting any signs of global illumination in this game. Not that this game needs it, but just out of curiosity I was looking for hints of it throughout the trailer to no avail. For instance, if the game supported indirect lighting, baked or otherwise, we should see some level of red hue transferring from the red surfaces under the desk here onto the white panel, but I see no evidence of that at all. Again, it's not really a big deal, but I do think it's worth mentioning. Having said that, we can see plenty of ambient occlusion, so that at least helps out with all of the objects in the room feeling a little more grounded. Something else I want to note about this scene is the sheer variety of material rendering on offer. This is completely uncharted territory for an Animal Crossing game. I want to say they started with a physically based framework and then tweaked the parameters until it conformed to their artistic sensibilities, but it's hard to say. At any rate, the lighting on most of the materials looks pretty good. The glossy specularity on the leaves here is actually impressive. It looks like an artificial plant, as they tend to have a more plastic-like appearance to them, but I think that's the look they were going for. The woven fabric on this sweater looks good as well, but the specular intensity might be a tad too much. Wool should not be this reflective. Other than that, I'd say the material is well rendered for this art style, and the Fresnel isn't overdone either. Here we can get a better glimpse at the size of the strands on the villagers' hair. They're not 3D modeled, but they are normal maps, so we can see darker shading in between each strand. Also take note of the difference in the lighting of Fuchsia's hair. The microstructure for this kind of hair is completely different, so the highlights will be different as well. I'm not going to break down the lighting of all the materials for every object in this room, but I will say that it's a pleasant surprise to see so much diversity in the way in which these different materials are rendered. Even with an art style like this, where diffuse reflections are typically the most dominant feature on most of the materials. Overall, Animal Crossing New Horizons appears to represent at least a generational leap in rendering technology compared to its predecessors, and is a shining example of how you can use modern advancements in rendering technology to enhance even the most simplistic art styles. And that's a wrap for our first tech analysis of Animal Crossing New Horizons. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to give it a like and share your thoughts with us in the comments below. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to Game Explain for more E3 related coverage and all things gaming. Cheers!